Welcome to another edition of A Closer Look. I'm Mark Schein with my good friend Mark Miller, and things are hopping around here. Looks like we've got an auction Ooh, here on Saturday. Oh, man, yeah, it's a big, big Saturday coming up. Uh, the studio is just stuffful and yeah. pretty cool stuff. We like to walk around and look at it, but Saturday, all day Saturday, under the big tent out here at TV44, come out and get yourself a bargain, get yourself uh, something you need, or just donate to the, the good cause of the station. I looked at a bike over here, mm -hmm. then I looked at a truck to get the bike home, and... <laughs> We'll see how it all goes. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, we're back with high school football for another week. And, Mark, uh, we're going to review some games from last week. First of all, go ahead. All right. Out of the WBL, a matchup of two of the tri-champions from last year. St. Mary's went up to Ottawa Glandorf. It was 0-0 at half, a defensive battle. And then 7-7 seven seven still early in the fourth quarter when Braden Dunlap from St. Mary's took a 90-yard kickoff return for a touchdown. A little bit later in the fourth quarter, St. Mary's is up 14 to 13 as OG just scored a touchdown and they decide to go for two thinking that that might be the last score of the game in this defensive battle and they could win it. They didn't make it. So they're still down by one point. Not too much later in that fourth quarter. Ty Slosser, a linebacker from St. Mary's, picked one off, went 55 yards for a touchdown. That kind of sealed the deal. St. Mary's running back Sean Perry, 118 yards rushing. He had 93 in the first half, even though no points. They shut him down in the second half. Ottawa Glendorf likes to run it, only 40 yards rushing in the whole game. Big win for St. Mary's. Staying in the Western Buckeye League in a game that kind of caught everybody by surprise when the store started coming across the ticker, and that was Van Wert and Wapakoneta. Now, if you look at what's going on in the 2010s, Van Wert, they're 30 and 13 and 50 over the last nine seasons. Wapak 54 and 9. Wapak won the game a year ago, 52 to 6. So you think, okay, this is a Wapak game. So it's 13-0 Van Wert. Now Wapak makes a run. It's tied at 13. You think, okay, the Redskins are on a roll. They'll just continue mm -hmm. it out. But no, this is a different Van Wert team. Van Wert scores to go up 20 to 13. Wapak ties it up. And then late in the game, a Van Wert 12 play, 73 yard drive. Nate Place goes in from a yard out. That puts the Cougars up on top. The final play of the game, at least for all intents and purposes, Place has an interception. Game over. Van Wert wins. They go to 2 0 for the first time since 2009. They get St. Mary's this weekend. Wow. New Bremen, Mississinawa Valley. How often have we talked about New Bremen? They've had rough go the last several years, 2-8 and eight last year, but they are now 2-0. and oh. They win 30 to nothing over Mississinawa Valley. I put that in there because I don't say that too. <laughs> they have two shutouts in their two games. They have St. Henry this Friday, so it gets real in a hurry in the MAC conference. The MAC in the first two weeks, non-conference play, 16 and 14. How about That's that? a pretty strong conference. Yep. Ada goes to Arlington this week. Ada was already 1-0. They'd beaten USV. Arlington had a bad loss to Anna. So you think, okay, this is going to be kind of a one-sided game, and it starts out that way. Ada is on top, 27 to 6, halfway through the third quarter. Conley already has four touchdown passes of 61, 12, 14, and 21. But then Arlington quarterback Jacob Russell gets it going. He throws two touchdown passes, cuts the lead to 27 to 20. Unfortunately, though, Russell hurt a leg. His replacement, Caleb Price, comes in, throws an INT to Chase Summers, returns it back to the 12 where Conley gets a rushing touchdown. Conley ends up 21 of 39, 840 yards throwing the football and four scores. And a rushing TD on top of that, Ada wins 34-20 over Arlington. And like every week, stat stuffers. We have guys that put up unbelievable numbers. Now, we could say the same three or four or five names every week. We're not going to do that, but there's plenty to spread the wealth. And, Mark, you starting off with a great quarterback over at Wayne Trace. All right, over at Wayne Trace, Trevor Spies, who was 20 of 50 with five scores as they win over McComb. You think, okay, a guy with five touchdown passes, he's just padding the stats. Not this time. They won 31-28. All of those were important scores. Yeah. They're 2 0 after beating Paulding in week one. Wayne Trace has got it going again. Marion Local, you know they got players. They got a new running back, though. His name is Nolan Habadaz. I think I got that right. He had 144 yards rushing and two touchdowns. He'll, they'll need him big this week as they should go to Coldwater. Go to Coldwater. Van Buren, Jacob Leal, 22 carries, 151 yards rushing the football. Touchdown runs, pair of one yard touchdown runs, a 10 yard run, an 18 yard run. Van Wert comes back from the loss over Carey and puts one on the Bluffton Pirates. Here is a repeat from last week. Lima senior quarterback Adrian Mitchell threw the ball for 269 yards and four touchdowns, ran the ball for 132 yards and two more touchdowns. We just couldn't keep him out as Lima senior beat Eastmore 55-24. 2-0 for the Spartans. And then we don't talk about Arcadia football very much, much like New Bremen, but Arcadia broke an 18-game winning streak. How do you do that? 
We hand the football off to a guy who doesn't like to lose. Trevor Brubaker, 23 carries, 224 yard touchdown runs of 49 and 40. Five. His team rushed for 412 yards, led by his 224. They beat Ridgemont, did Arcadia 51-12 and broke an 18-game losing streak. Here's another 2-0 team that hadn't been 2-0 in a long time. Shawnee off to a great start, and their quarterback, Johnny Caprella, listen to this. 12 of 17, 375 yards, six touchdowns. He had completed 12, six of them were touchdowns. He ran the ball for two more touchdowns. That's eight he touchdowns. Scores. That's more than I had in my whole high school career. What a day for him. They beat Defiance 56-7. My son in from Boston looked at that score and said, isn't that, shouldn't that be the other way around? When he played here, it was just the opposite every year. Defiance was spanking everybody, but boy, Shawnee off to a great start. We've got some teams that are really starting to turn it around in our area. Yep. Well, another thing we wanted to add this week was our fun football fact, and you've got one for us. All right, right, let's look at the largest high school football stadiums capacity-wise in the state of Ohio, and there is a rendition a drawing, that stadium is actually up now. You could, we, we could have had a live picture, but this was better for you to see it. This is called the Tom Benson Hall of Fame Stadium in Canton, Ohio. Used to be called the John Fawcett Stadium, but Tom Benson, the Saints owner, New Orleans Saints, plunked down a lot of money to get his name on that stadium. It seats 22,364 people, as you can see. The next largest is Maslin's Paul Brown Stadium, right next door. And there you can see it's just under 17,000. We looked at the two most local large stadiums. A lot of us, especially in playoffs, been down to Piqua, 9,000. And Sydney Memorial at 7,500, two of the biggest stadiums in the state of Ohio. A lot of the big stadiums are community stadiums right. like Tom Benson Stadium. But Sydney and Piqua, especially Piqua, just one, one team plays in there. Memory is slipping me. The OHSAA playoffs finals, they go back to Tom Benson. Back this to year? Canton. They'll be yeah, played right. in that stadium in this that year. Stadium, they're all there this year. They're not flipping yeah. them back and forth. No more Maslin, just all Canton. That's right. Okay. Well, also, we get to this point in the season. The NFL teams yeah. did their cut downs over the weekend. We like to look at what our area guys have done, and you uh, compiled the list. Well, we've had a lot of guys locally the last several years playing. We've been on quite a run, actually. And, and this year, at least as we speak now, although we don't know what's going on on the phones, we have no one in the NFL on an active roster right now. Jared Pugsley got released by the Ravens. He's a Lima senior guy. Keith Winning from Coldwater got released by the Bills. Zach Dysert from Ada injured earlier uh, in the Dallas Cowboys camp is out. Uh, you know, if you look, look back just a few years ago, we had those three guys on active rosters. We had Jordan Thompson with the Detroit Lions, Kyle Miller with several different teams. We were very lucky to have some local flavor in the NFL. Now we're looking for that next wave of great players coming out of college, and maybe they're even in high school right now. Yeah, we're on our way to Coldwater this week. Maybe that'd be a good topic for discussion. Which That's guys right. do we got around we might see next on NFL yeah. rosters? That That's might right. be a good one. Well, in our bright spot this week, we have something special coming up in Allen County. Mark and I sat in a meeting last of April, I guess it would have been, discussing Revive Allen County. It's a big spiritual event that's going to take place throughout the county from September 10 through 16. Over 50 churches involved, mm -hmm. lots of ministries, FCAs involved. It's going to be a great event. It sure should be, and if, if your church is not involved, you can still be involved. Get in uh, evening, day, uh, all times of the day during that week, and it's going to be a great week for this area and certainly Allen County. Okay. Well, a year ago, in fact, more than a year ago, you and I and some people here at WSN started having discussions about our national anthem and behavior during the national anthem and the proper way to do things. And the first thing we want to get this, this has nothing to do with Colin Kaepernick, protests, whatever. This started a long time before that took place. We just noticed kind of a lack of decorum and behavior by teams, by fans, by, by players and so on, cheerleaders and so on. Is there a way that we could get the word out what is the proper behavior mm -hmm. during the National Anthem? Do a little research. 36 U.S. Code states number 301 says a person should present the flag with their face, stand at attention with their right hand over their heart. Mm -hmm. And we're going to do something about it. That's right. We've crafted a letter with the blessings of WOSN, and we sent it to all the area athletic directors. And it, it, this is not a, a correction or a criticism. It's just an awareness. I mean, until we started talking about it, we didn't even know what that statute was. Yeah. Uh, but just something to make people aware. We've talked to several coaches, athletic directors, cheerleading advisors, and say, why do you do this or what made you decide to do this? And the answer we get overwhelmingly mm -hmm. is, 
We've just always done it that way. Right. Well, let's just be aware, and maybe some will choose to do it according to the statute. Maybe some won't, and that's not ours to criticize. But we do plan on showing the ones that do it properly yeah. and correctly and promote that on our show and also on our broadcast. Well, we notice you know, some teams, they like to lock arms and swing arms or hold hands or they do something. Okay, here is the proper way. Yeah. Face the flag, hand over heart. And obviously stay rigid and pay attention and sing along if you can yeah, that's right. uh, with the National Anthem. But again, we, I've seen uh, several volleyball teams doing it this year. And then we even talked to the athletic director at Crestview who said, it's in our student policy. Uh, it's in awesome? our handbook, yeah, which I think is right. a great idea. And maybe some schools will follow that as well. Be a leader in your community, not just as a, a player or a cheerleader or a majorette or a fan, but be a leader in your community and, and let's try to spark some, some proper behavior. Okay, Mark, our question mark this week on our very opening show, you said, <laughs> well, I think maybe... Onside kicks off are over. Yeah. Yeah, not this week. What yeah, we unintentional onside <laughs> kick. We're over at Jefferson Stadium Park, and here's Jefferson kicking off to Versailles into a very stiff wind. You can see the kick returners were back inside their 10-yard line. That ball went up in the air, and Mark and I immediately looked at each other and said, he ain't ever going to get to it. And he didn't. Look at this. You guys that have a great nine iron on the greens, <laughs> that ball's checking up right there. Def Jefferson recovers it. That's the longest onside kick you'll ever see. Wasn't meant to be a bloop. He tried to pound it, but that means Jefferson gets the ball right there where it's recovered. Was a huge flip of the field. Jefferson went on. I think they scored after that. They did. And they ended up winning the game. Yeah, it was a 14-7 game. This ends up becoming a huge play. Every time Versailles makes a run at Jefferson, Jefferson hangs on, but that was a huge play. Yeah. Set up their second score, put them up 14-0. Yeah. He was playing that particular point of the game. Hey, we got a Twitter handle. We do. And if you've got yep. questions that you want us to research and bring an answer to everybody, you got to send it in. I don't, I don't know what the Twitter handle well, is. Well, we're going to we'll tell they, them later. Okay. Well, watermark it up there. Hey, I learned that term. There it is. Yeah, there it is. Last send week, it to us. Uh, as of last Friday, we had 145 people on our Twitter account. I, if I knew how to do it, we'd have 146. <laughs> <laughs> Let's preview games coming up this week, Mark. And I'm going to start out with Liberty Benton and Lipsick. Well, both of these teams are 2-0. and They've done it in opposite directions. Uh, Winford, uh, Liberty Benton beat Winford 49-0. Then they hung on to beat Archibald 34-33. Austin May scored late. Then they blocked a field goal attempt by Archibald. It would have won the game. Their averaging Liberty Benton is 41.5 points a game, 354.5 yards of offense. Austin May, the quarterback, running back Sadler and Greer. They've got it all going offensively. On the other side, Lipsick, if you score 20 points, can you be 2-0? and well, Lipsick <laughs> is. They won 7-6 over Patrick Henry, 13-6 over Columbus wow. Grove. They're getting it done defensively. Their offense, obviously only 10 points a game. Only 216 yards of total offense on the average per game. They need to get some things going. Dylan Schrader struggled a little bit early in the, in the season in the first game. Had a much better game at quarterback position. They need to get Gavin Lamelli going. He had a, almost 1,100 yards rushing a year ago. He hasn't got it going yet. Maybe he can this week. Liberty Benton was the champions of this conference in 2014. Lipsick in 2011. The winner of this game. Head in that direction, maybe. There you go. Let's go to the west side of our viewing area. Crestview, 2-0. At Wayne Trace, 2-0. Crestview, of course, they got quarterback Drew Klein last week. Completed a high percentage of his passes. A couple hundred yards, two touchdowns. He also runs the ball for 81 yards and another touchdown. Wide receiver Wayne Sheets. Now, if you got a quarterback throwing it all over, you probably got a leading receiver, right? Wade Sheets, 11 catches, 124, and two touchdowns. Wayne Trace on the other side, they beat McComb. Yeah, they beat McComb. Not many can say that over right. the last several years since Chris Algie's been up there. 31-28, quarterback Trevor Spees, as we already talked about, had a very nice game. This is huge because this is a rival game, man. They're right next door to each other in every sport, but it's football's turn. This should be a lot of fun this week, Crestview and Wayne Trace. Well, one more we're going to look at is before we check out of here, and that's the game you and I get to do, and that's Marion Local and Coldwater. Marion Local is 2-0. They've got the wins over Dayton Chaminade and Patrick Henry by big scores. Tim Goodwin's 18th year has won 83% of his football games. <laughs> Chip Otten down at Coldwater, they're one and one, defeated Kenton, lost to a very good Clinton Massey team. If a stat came out of that game that was unusual, Coldwater rushed for a negative 17 yards. So some of that was sacks and things like that. This game has been decided the last two years by Coldwater field goals. Mullenkamp last year, McKibben the year before, both scores were 17-14. 28 MAC championships between them. 15 wow. OHSAA state championships, which won't happen this year because now they're in the same region. D6 region 24, thanks to the way we shook things up. There's the game preview. Maybe the most important thing for some people, there's the 50-50 boxes are holding the 50-50 tickets for this game. Last year, the takeaway 
14.7. That broke the 11,000 record from the year before. There's going to be a lot of tickets And down Mark here. says he'll gladly take your money <laughs> and buy your ticket, but only one ticket wins, and we're pretty sure it's going to be the it, one he has it in won't, his pocket. It won't be your ticket. I can guarantee you that if one <laughs> ticket wins. All right, Mark. <laughs> That's where you and I get to go. That'll be a great game. Yeah, it always is. Let's yeah. look at our broadcast schedule for this week. A uh, big volleyball matchup between two powerhouse teams, Fort Laramie and Ottawa Glendorf. That's on tomorrow night at 8 o'clock. Then, as we said, uh, New Bremen volleyball. That's on Friday night with Mary Local. Two powers in the MAC conference. Had a chance to watch New Bremen on TV last uh, Sunday night. Then it looks like it's MAC football this weekend. DSJ and Minster, they're both 2 0. Mary Local and Coldwater, that's always a great showdown game. The Saturday games, Liberty Bent, the Ellipsic we just mentioned, Elida Salina, Bulldogs are 2 0. Well, the Elida Bulldogs are 2 0. That's our game on Saturday night that you can see from Friday night action. And Mark and I will be back next week with another edition of A Closer Look. You've been watching High School Football on WOSN.